Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Hotline Ministry. Do you feel like right now in our culture, in our society, in our world, that you are in a very dry place and you have an unquenchable thirst? Well, Tim and I are going to discuss this afternoon how, we, how you can have your thirst quenched and satisfied by the Lord Jesus Christ. See you in just a few moments. Well, once again, greetings. Thank you so much for tuning in to Hotline Ministry. This is a ministry where we take the Word of God and, and try to apply what the Lord Jesus Christ has given to us and what God himself has given to us through his Word that will quench our thirst. And that's what we're talking about today is that Jesus Christ came to satisfy our thirsty souls. We're going to be talking out of John chapter 4, and Jesus going into Samaria and talking to the Samaritan woman at the, at the well of Jacob, and we're going to be uh, discussing that as well as some other scripture verses. But it's just such a delight to be able to come to you and share with you um, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been discussing reasons why Jesus came to earth, and this is the 29th out of 31, so uh, we just have a couple of weeks left in this topic, and Tim and I are praying um, to see what God would have us to do um, after the next couple of weeks. But he came to quench and to satisfy our thirst. And I'm wondering today, do you have a thirst that is just unquenchable? Do you have a thirst that you just don't seem to be able to be satisfied in your life? You think that things are just topsy-turvy and, and there's no satisfaction at all? Well, we're going to try to share with you today out of John chapter 4 how you can have your thirst satisfied. Tim, I'm going to have you read John chapter 4, verses 1 through, what, 26, I think it is. If you would read that for us, just to give us the whole picture of what Jesus, the account that Jesus gives uh, concerning his encounter with the Samaritan woman. Would you read that, please? Sure will. So starting at verse 1, and I'm reading out the New King James this morning. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sakar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. 
But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship, or, or we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will teach us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Let's ask the Lord to be with us for the next few moments as we discuss this portion of Scripture as well as others and to help all of us to really have a satisfying quench of the thirst that is in our life. Mm. And whatever that thirst is, you know, whatever the things are that is, that is happening in our life, we know that there is one who satisfies, and it is God himself. And today we're going to share that with you in John 4. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful mm. account where Jesus told us that he had to go through Samaria. And Father God, there's nobody beyond his reach. There's nobody whom he doesn't love. There's nobody that he won't reach out to. There's nobody that he won't um, give this, this satisfying water to. And Father God, we ask if there's anybody watching today that is really feeling like they're parched and, and they're just um, very dry, that Father God, you will help them to see that you do, in fact, give living, quenchable water. So, Lord, bless our time. Use it for your glory in your precious name. Amen. Amen. You know, Tim, one of the things that, that I think is very interesting and, and very timely uh, in this is because last night at prayer meeting, I heard that we have four families in our church that uh, their wells have run dry. Mm. You know, we have a drought here in, in the Northeast. Uh, I understand down south, they're, they're flooding, but up, up here, we're in a very hard drought. And we have some families that uh, their wells have run dry, and, and of course they're, they're going about to neighbors and friends and trying to get drinking water and washing water and all that stuff. But in this, the woman is looking at Jesus in the physical sense, which would be mm -hmm. the water from our wells, yep. but Jesus is drawing her into a spiritual conversation, mm -hmm. a conversation that goes well beyond what we see materially or physically. Mm -hmm. And and we need to be able to see that, yeah. you know. And I thought it very interesting. Verse four to me is a very telling verse, where it says, "And he must needs go through Samaria." Mm -hmm. What do you think? What was it that that drew him to Samaria? What was it that that made? Because Jews didn't go through Samaria, right? In fact, they would deliberately go out of their way and make a longer travel because right. it would have been shorter to go through Samaria, but it would actually take longer to go around it. And um, because of this battle that really existed between who was worshiping in the right place. And, um, and because of this, yeah, the Jews didn't have anything to do with them. But so the fact that Jesus, as a Jew, who made it very clear that his ministry was to the Jews, for him to say, I've got to go through Samaria, says one of two things. Either this woman was of such great importance mm -hmm. Um, or there's something beyond just this one woman that God was going to do. And we actually see both take place in this passage. doesn't so much go into it right there, that portion that we read, but we see a great revival really take place in Samaria. Right, right. Um, through what transpired between Jesus and this one woman at the well. You know, one of the things that, that just so thrills my heart when I read this portion of Scripture and you go down even further that I read this is, is that there's nobody beyond God's reach. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter 
Um, I know I've had people in my ministry, you probably have in your ministry, that have said, well, you know, I've got some things i got to work out first. Mm -hmm. I've got some things I've got to take care of before I commit to God or before I commit to the Lord Jesus. You know, I've got, I got to clean up my act. Mm -hmm. And this portion of Scripture really dispels that theory or that train of thought that I have to, I have to fix myself before I can come to God. Mm -hmm. Because certainly Jesus is saying to this woman, look, uh, your life's a mess. Mm -hmm. And... But I have to come. I had to come see you. Mm -hmm. You know, I was drawn to you. I was, mm -hmm. I was. Um, oh, I, I, I don't want to say it this way, but I, the only way I know how. I was pushed by my father to come to Samaria mm -hmm. because you were here. Yeah. And I came for you. Mm -hmm. Now, come to find out that it's going to go for you and all the people in Saika. Yeah. But it started with the woman. Mm -hmm. it started with, and and to me that is so. Uh, heartening to know that no matter where we are, Jesus Christ wants to come and, and give us his living water. And that's so important, no matter where we are. Because you think about with this one, it, it's one encounter between Jesus and one woman, but how many barriers did he break right. in this one encounter? He broke racial, mm -hmm. he broke cultural, he broke sexual, he broke spiritual barriers, yep. Yep. all those things. Because she was a Samaritan, she was a woman, she was not a Jew, <laughs> yep. and she had sin in her life, and right. he was a holy God. So he bypassed all the major areas. He crossed all those gaps just to reach her. You know, and, and to me, that is the neat thing about it, because today we look in our culture, and, and you know, this is nothing new to anybody who's going to be watching, but if we look in our culture whether it be here in the States or all over the world, is the culture is, is there's so many barriers. You know, you got the color barrier, you got the religious barrier, you got all these barriers. And, and Jesus, in talking to this woman, dispels all of those. Mm -hmm. And says, wait a minute, in me, there's no barriers. Yeah. You know, I don't care what color you are. I don't care, really, I don't even care what religion you are because the woman says, we go up into the mountains and we, you know, we worship these idols. And you go to Jerusalem to worship, you know, and he and so he dispels the religious barrier, mm -hmm. you know, and he and he, you know, and and I think that's where we as people really need to get a hold of ourselves and say, wait a minute, let's break down all these barriers. Mm -hmm. And the one potential barrier that still had existed, Jesus deliberately made sure went another direction because he said, you know, I think the way it worded it here was that. Um, Trying to see how he put that exactly where it was, but he had basically it says he had. Uh, I think it alluded there about him sending the disciples. Yeah, he sent his disciples and, and, and away. And we see that in, or at least in another one of the gospel accounts, yeah. you see where those exact wordings where he sent them away. He deliberately got rid of them. Yeah, and and he had to say, well, why? And of course, we see that then all the way down where we actually stopped reading. Yeah. In verse 27, where it said, At this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman. There's the sexual barrier. Yeah. You know one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? Right. Because she is a woman. She is a Samaritan. He knew that there would be such um, controversy with his disciples. They would have so many of their own questions. John, I'm not even going to deal with them right now. There's something more important I need to deal with. So let's just send them off over here so I can deal with her first. Yeah. And then by the time they get there, then I can deal with them. Yeah, I, I really think that there is, you know, I mean, he sent them off to buy meat. Mm -hmm. Now, how many men does it, care, does it take to carry a bag of meat? Right. You know, for a small band of guys, right? So, but he sent them all off so that he could be by himself with her. Yeah. Now, some of the other barriers that, that have been broken by this is that, first of all, Jews did not talk to Sumerians. Men did not talk to women in public. Mm -hmm. Men were not even taught to their wives in public. Back in those days, you know, that was a culture in which they were in. Mm -hmm. So for Jesus, even to initiate the conversation, it was not the woman who initiated the conversation. Right. It was Jesus who initiated the conversation mm -hmm. because she wouldn't have because she knew that she couldn't speak to him. In fact, that's the reason she went to that well at noon. I've said the sixth hour here, but that would be yep. noontime. Right. 
all the other women went earlier in the day. Sure. The reason she went then is because of her questionable lifestyle, and she didn't want to encounter anybody. Yep. And so she deliberately chose a time where nobody would be at the well. But she said, yeah, guess again. <laughs> yeah. So, so actually, she was a woman who was, in my view at least, would be terribly ostracized mm-hmm. by even um, her neighbors and, her, and those people who were around her. Why? Because of her lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, she had taken 500 husbands of her own, and the man that she was with was not her husband. That would probably get some women pretty upset, mm-hmm. right? So they were ostracizing her. They were, you know, they had nothing good to say about it. They mm-hmm. hated her. Yeah. So she had to come by herself so that she would not encounter this hatred, this, this uh, once again, this ostracizing of, of the women around her. Because, again, even with, you know, Nick, not just with her behavior was she ostracized, but you can see, as comes about in the midst of this conversation later, there's some sort of religious aspect to this woman. So was she involved in the church to some level? Yeah. You know, um, but she was proclaiming as a Samaritan that we worship yeah. here. You know, and that there's something about her that, that speaks of a some sort of a religion, religious connection. And uh, so the fact that she's claiming that, but yet she's living something that was that uh, even in that day amongst the world mm-hmm. seemed to be very sinful, even if you were not a believer. Right. You know, what I also think is very interesting in this account is that Jesus, of course, being divinely God, I mean, that's mm-hmm. who he is. He is God. Uh, we even see that when he goes and says, I that speak unto you am he. Uh, that would be the, the same equivalent as I am, Mm -hmm. which is his divine name, is God, that he knew that it wasn't 9 o'clock in the morning where the women would all come up in the coolness of the day before it got hot and and Mm -hmm. all that, but it was at the heat of the day that she would be there, and Mm -hmm. he wanted to see her there at noon. So because of his divine personage as to who he was, he knew who it was that was going to be at that well at noon. You know, so to me, that is so very, very interesting. You know, one of the things that you brought up just a moment, you know, a minute ago about his disciples. In verse 27, where Jesus sent them out so that he could be by himself with this woman. Mm -hmm. Now, in verse 27, it says, Upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. I mean, they were scratching their heads saying, wait, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. Why is he talking to this Samaritan, this this dog, I mean, that's what they even called him. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, just a low name. Yeah. And they marveled at it. But what I thought was really interesting in this portion is yet no man said, what seeketh thou? Or why talkest thou to her? They didn't dare to ask him, mm-hmm. why are you talking to her? Mm-hmm. But they were thinking it. Oh, they were thinking <laughs> it. And Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking. Yeah. You know, um, he knew what was upon their heart. And as you said, I think that's why he sent them away, you know, all of them so that nobody would get in the way. Nobody would put their foot in their mouth and say something stupid, you know, while he was trying to minister to her, Mm -hmm. you know, because I'm sure one of them would have said something, you know, dumb. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to put up with that because I need to minister to this woman myself and touch her that way. Yeah. And again, come back to what you had shared, and um, if you were to jump all the way down to verse 34, we know that Jesus was, as you said, pushed by the Father. Because it said that Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Yeah. Because this was his aspect. In fact, they just now offered him food, and he's like, nah, if I, I've had yeah. food you can't even imagine. Yeah. It's like, well, hold it. Who brought him stuff? Yeah, who I brought him something right. to eat? Yeah. We, what do you send us all the way the other way for if you are already sure. going to have something to eat? You yeah. know, it's the attitude almost there. But, his, but then Jesus says, no, my... What I've got to do is I've got to do the Father's will. Yeah. So that right there tells you to see the Samaritan woman at this. You would not normally encounter anybody at that well. The Holy Spirit, you know, the Father himself, through the Holy Spirit, had to have shared with him, look, I'm going to have a woman there yeah. that I need you to speak into the life of, and she'll be there at this specific point of the day. You know, I think you bring out a, a wonderful point because we— you know, because we believe that Jesus is entirely God, mm-hmm. but he also was entirely man minus sin. Mm-hmm. So why would Jesus, being entirely God, still have to depend upon the Holy Spirit of God? 
because he was sent to model for us what it means to walk in the Spirit. Yep. Because it tells us um, that he had laid aside all of his glory, laid aside everything that he had so that he could take on the nature of a man. Sure. Which basically says that I'm laying aside, not that he ceased to be God, I'm not saying that, but he did lay down an aspect of his divinity. Oh, absolutely. In, including this whole aspect to the point where he could show us and demonstrate that it is possible to allow the Holy Spirit to literally direct your every step. Yeah. You know, and the other question I want to ask or, or talk about just for a moment before we get to this whole account again, because you brought it up. Shame on you, but you brought it up. Fine, you got my now mind you're going to throw another question at me. So he goes and says, <laughs> you know, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. That's one thing. You and I go and want to do what God has sent us to do, but there's another aspect to it, and that is the end of verse 34, and to finish his work. Mm. We are not just simply to start a work and then, you know, halfway through it say, well, it's too tough, I can't do it, or these people won't listen to me anyway, so I'm not going to do it, or whatever the case. No, God says, I'm going to send you to go do a work, and I want you to finish it. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Apostle Paul says. I have finished the course. Yep. I have fought the good fight. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that's what we as Christians need to do. We need to know that God has sent us to do a work, but not only sent us to do a work, but he also sent us to finish the work. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't want us to do a half-hearted job. Yeah. And when Jesus went to see this woman, it was out of his way. Mm -hmm. It was against all rules and regulations. It was against all customs. It was against everything. But he said, look, my father has sent me here for a very specific purpose. And we touched on it a few weeks ago. Why did Jesus come? He came to seek and to save that which is lost. Mm-hmm. And certainly some people would say, especially some religious people would say, that, well, certainly there would be nobody any uh, loss any greater than this woman. Look at her lifestyle. Mm. Well, the only thing I would say to those people was, well, just because you don't do her sin, guess what? Your sin is just as great. Yeah. You know, so it's for all of us. It's mm -hmm. not just for this yeah, There's person. no degrees of sin in no. the sight of God. Sin is sin. Yeah, so who puts the degrees on sin? Man does. Right. You know, not God does. Sin to God is sin. I don't care if it's stealing a little, you know, candy bar. When I was a kid, it was a 20 cent candy bar. Now it's, what, a buck 50 or something. You know, stealing a candy bar or stealing something greater. No, it's just stealing. Mm -hmm. So sin is sin that is sin to God. And the same thing with this. So, so Jesus now goes, and, and he, and he prompt. What I, what I love about this is Jesus is the one who prompts the conversation. Mm-hmm. He's the one who goes, you know, I, I read the scripture, and I can't remember where it was, and I did a message on this. I may even have the notes back here. I did a message on this just a few weeks ago out of Acts, where it's, I think, Acts 17, that none seek him. No, not one. Mm -hmm. Nobody seeks God. So how is it that we come to know God? Holy Spirit draws us. He's, so it is God seeking us. Mm-hmm. I had, a, I had an occasion recently, you know, let's say within the last number of months, where somebody asked us if we were a seeker-sensitive church. Now, today, in today's vernacular, the seeker-sensitive church is people who go to church and they're seeking for something. So I thought about it for a minute, and I was saying, well, no, I'm not really a seeker-sensitive church, but I am a seeker-sensitive church because I am sensitive to the seeker, and the seeker is not man, the seeker is God. Mm -hmm. He is the one that I am sensitive to because he is the one who seeks us out. Mm -hmm. We don't seek out God on our own. This woman was not going to leave Samaria to try to find Jesus. Mm -hmm. But Jesus left Jerusalem to try to find the woman. Mm -hmm. So he is the seeker. He is the one who drew, drew you yep. into salvation and you into ministry. Mm -hmm. Drew me into salvation and me into ministry. Right. I did not, we did not come to Jesus Christ on our own. We did not have a premonition one day and say, oh, I think today I'll seek God. No, right. that isn't the way it works. God was tugging on my heart for over two years before mm -hmm. I finally came to him and submitted to him. Mm -hmm. But he kept on seeking yeah. me out. Now, the important thing, though, for us to make note of is he is not willing that any should perish. Right. So the Holy Spirit is actively seeking everyone. That's right. In fact, everyone listening to this program right now, if you don't know God, understand this, he is seeking you right now. 
and the fact that you're watching this program exactly. is a way in which he is to, trying to seek you out and trying to help you see who he is. Exactly. And um, so, you know, there are some that would almost hold this belief that, well, he only seeks some and doesn't seek others. But no, he seeks yep. us all. Thing is, but like you just said, it took you how many years of him yep. really seeking you before you responded. Sure. But um, I'm a slow learner. Yeah. And most of us <laughs> are. I mean, most people that I've talked to, it's a minimum of a year and sometimes in yep. far excess of a year. Sure. But I see very few that can't say, yeah, God actually started working on me at least a year in advance, yep. little by little, before I made the decision. And that's the thing, is once you come to know him, mm -hmm. you can look back into your life and you can see the increments in which God is working, whether it be through a relative or a friend mm -hmm. or somebody, maybe a television program, maybe even a Christian song, whatever, that started to spark your interest in, yep. wait a minute, this is so beautiful. This is, there's got to be something to this. Mm -hmm. And it's for me, yeah. not just for Tim Golden or yeah. for the you who are watching. No, this is for me mm -hmm. that he did this. Yeah. You know, so we, we look at it. I mean, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. How many of us are lost? Every one of us. All of us were lost at one time. Okay? So he, he came to seek and save everybody. That is to John 3.16. Whosoever mm -hmm. believeth on him. The whosoever includes all the billions of people mm -hmm. who have ever lived on planet Earth That's right. from the beginning of time and to the end of time, mm -hmm. that he is seeking all of them. Yeah. And it's a choice of each of us to either accept or reject. It was the choice of this woman. Was she going to accept this living water that Jesus was going to give her, or was she going to reject it? Mm. You know, uh, Jesus didn't come with a, with a ladle or a bucket to draw water. You know, he had something better. He had an eternal water to mm -hmm. give to her, not this just this physical quenching mm -hmm. for just a few moments. Yeah. You know, I find, for example, with with my disease that I have, that in the medicine, that I'm drinking constantly bottles of water. I just can't. I can't quench it. You know, the physical thirst because of my meds. But I I know that I have someone who has quenched my spiritual thirst, mm -hmm. and his name is Jesus Christ, and it's written for us right here in such a vivid picture mm. of what he is saying to the woman. So he yeah. starts the conversation in verse 7, Tim. There comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me to drink. You know, so he goes to her and he says, look, I'm thirsty. I need something to drink. Draw some water for me. You know, which, once again, goes, through, goes against all the customs. It goes through mm -hmm. all the all the cultural divides that you had already previously mentioned. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, but, he, but he's the one who initiated. And it, Jesus Christ will always be the one to initiate. Mm -hmm. That's why I call, he is the seeker. Nobody seeks mm -hmm. him. He seeks us out. He's always the initiator. Mm -hmm. And it starts right here with this woman. And even though he's always the initiator, he always um, elicits a response. Yeah. You know, he comes, he came to Samaria, he sat down, he provided himself the living water, is what he's referring to as was himself. And so he sits there and but now that he's brought as much as he can bring, now he looks at her and says, I'm calling you to do something. I'm calling you for a response. Yep. Yeah, in, in in fact as, as we go further on this, I really find that there were two responses that he was looking for. He was looking for, for the response of honesty, mm -hmm. and he was looking for the response of responsibility. Yeah. Honesty and responsibility. He's saying, look, I'm willing to give you this free gift of salvation, but you have to be willing to take it. You have to take the responsibility to take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got it out here free to you. All you've got to do is reach out and take it. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he's saying to her. In fact, even in verse 10, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that says to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would give thee living water. So what is he saying? Look, you have to ask me. Mm -hmm. You have to invite me in. Yep. One of the neat things that, I, that I, I love about the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, and I have for the 50 years I've been saved, is I love about him, is Jesus Christ does not take a battering ram and force himself in and says, you don't have any choice. I'm going to come into your life, and that's it. He doesn't do that. You know, I love the picture of, of him knocking on the door. 
You know, right. that beautiful picture mm -hmm. of him knocking on the door. One of the things that you will find in that picture, there's no door handle on the outside. Yeah. The door handle is on the inside. Mm -hmm. The person on the inside has to open the door and say, come on in. Yeah. And that's exactly what salvation is for you and me. Mm -hmm. And it's the very same thing. But I love that word newest in verse 10. If thou knew the gift of God and who it was. The word new means I want to have a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. I do not want this just to be a uh, one, afternoon, one afternoon encounter with you. That isn't what he's looking for. Right. I want this to be a life-changing encounter for the rest of your life. And that's what Jesus Christ wants to do. When he talks mm -hmm. about giving us satisfying water, I want to encounter your life for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. I want to be so involved in your life for the rest of your life. Not just now. How many people do we know that have an emotional experience and it only lasts a few days or maybe a few weeks, maybe even a couple of years, mm -hmm. but then it, it, it kind of wanes and it kind of dies. That isn't what Jesus Christ wants. And that isn't the desire of his heart. Right. In fact, I love what he says down there in verse 14 where he says, um, not only do I give you living water, but the living water I give will actually become within you a fountain of water mm -hmm. springing up into everlasting life. So it, it's an ongoing, that there's a continual refreshing yeah. that is always going to be there. And it, it doesn't mean that it won't wane if we don't pay attention to it. But what it's saying is if you're walking with me, You'll never have to worry about not having this water of life because when you partake of my salvation, it's it's there for you. Yeah. You know, and there's going to come times you're going to get it right. There's times you're going to not, not get it right. But if you've named my name, if, if you've chosen to accept the gift of my salvation and really let me change your heart, you'll never thirst again. You'll never be without that water. You'll never be without that life flow because that's really what it was getting at because water, we know for a fact scientifically today that basically can go up to probably about three days without water and then you will die, you know? Mm -hmm. You need water. It is the essence of life itself. But Jesus is saying, I am now the essence of that life. You just need to let me take up residence. And, cont and just like with regular water, we need to have a constant, constantly partake of him. Yeah. Which means we're constantly engaged in that relationship. It's not like we just say a prayer once when we're 10 or 12 or 38, you right. know, um, and, and then we're done. It, it's, you, may, you start the journey, but then every day I'm partaking. Right. You know, every day we're drinking water or we're eating water, you mm -hmm. know, in, in some of the foods that we have. But, um, but there's constantly ingesting. And, and so there's got to be this aspect in our walk where we're constantly ingesting him as well. You know, and, and the, I think one of the real keys here is um, when I was looking down, today we're having a, a water shortage up here in the Northeast. Like I said, we have, I think, four families in our church that are that their wells have gone dry and all of that. But, you know, the neat thing about it is how how you have this, this well of water that is springing up. As a matter of fact, I think David the psalmist goes and says, it overflows. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember one of the pastors that I had over in Benton, New Hampshire, a uh, family of our church built a brand new house and they had an artesian well uh, dug at their house. And this artesian well had so much water in it that it was even in the hottest of summers, it had an overflow. And that's what I like it, that Jesus is saying to her, mm -hmm. even in, in the worst of times, there's going to be an overflow of my water for you. There will always be enough to quench your thirst, mm -hmm. always. I, I am not of lack of water, yep. you know, and, and he, is, he is there. So, so he goes and, and, he, and he talks to her about, about what it is that she has to do. I think in verse 21, and, you know, we can go back up to some of the others, but verse 21, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. And I love that. I, I, what I find here is that there's a word missing that a lot of people like to put in there. Believe on me. No, no. Just believe me. Right. I love that. You know, mm -hmm. um, because what does he say? Look, I have spoken it. Mm -hmm. It's done. Yeah. It's complete. Just believe me. And that's where we as people have to be. We have to mm -hmm. come to the point where we're going to believe 
God as God. Mm-hmm. Not just believe in parts of him or not just believe yeah. in, in you know, little bits of him, but not believe all of it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like you and I. I mean, we take this to be the literal word of God. This mm-hmm. is the inerrant, infallible word of God. Yep. It does not contain the word of God. It is the word of God. Mm-hmm. All of it. All scripture is given by inspiration yep. of God. That means from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, whatever the mm-hmm. last verse is. You know, 22, 21, I think it's, you know, it's all God. Mm-hmm. This is all God's word. And that's what he's trying to convey to this woman. Yeah. Believe me. Yeah. It's just, you can take this to the bank. Yeah. Oh, it's as good as done. Yeah. It's as good as done. You know, what I, what I really thought was really, really interesting, and as Jesus is talking to, to this woman, he had not come to the cross yet. Right. He had not been buried. He had not been resurrected. He had not been ascended. But he's talking to her as if he had. Mm. You know, because he's going, he said, if you knew the gift, verse 10, and who it is that says to you, give me this drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So he says, look, even though I have not yet died, I have not yet been buried, I have not yet been uh, uh, resurrected, I have not yet even been ascended, Mm -hmm. but you know something? It's as good as done. It's as good as done. And that's how God the Father. I, what I love, for example, is a scripture verse that goes and says that God knew us before the foundations of the world. Mm-hmm. What does that say to us? That even before the foundation, even before the beginning of time as man knows it, mm-hmm. God had already said, it's finished. Yeah. Isn't that what Jesus said on the cross? Mm-hmm. It's finished. Yeah. It's done. Yeah. It's completed. It's Je- brought to a fulfillment. Jesus was not a plan B. Yeah. Right. His death and resurrection was a plan B. Now, was it God's desire that it would never go to that level? Absolutely. But he also knew man that we would probably make that choice to go our own way. Oh, sure. It was just a matter of time. Yep. It, wasn't, it wasn't an if, but it was a when. And he's like, when that day comes, I've already got the plan in place. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things, and, and you beautifully mentioned this just a little bit ago in our conversation is that you know there has to be a response Mm. Uh, and and i think the first response that that this woman had to come to and i think the very first response that we had to come to in our coming to know christ as our personal savior is we had to be honest Mm -hmm. we had to be honest to ourselves but we also had to be honest with god Mm -hmm. you know how many times do we want to you know, think that I'm honest with myself, but try to hide little bits and pieces. Well, his Jesus. You can't hide anything from him. Mm-hmm. And Jesus forced her to be honest. Mm-hmm. And for us today, if we're leading, if, if we're talking to a person about the Lord Jesus Christ and their need to trust Christ as their Savior, we need to be honest with them. And matter of fact, I'm going to go over to 1 Corinthians 15 just for a second because I want to show you the honesty in which God, is, God requires for us. He's talking about the gospel. And in verse 1 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, so this is the good news, mm-hmm. that I preached unto you, also which you received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. Because you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have died. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for what? Our sins. Our sins. How many people do we talk to who do not want to recognize that they're sinners? Mm-hmm. We have to be honest with ourselves and say, wait a minute, God says that we are. You know, mm-hmm. some people say, well, yeah, but I'm not as bad as this woman. No, but what God is telling us and showing us is that no matter how bad mm-hmm. we are, God is willing to take us into his family. But the thing is, is we need to invite him to do that. Mm -hmm. And the only way we can invite him to do that is to be honest with ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, I need a Savior. You know, I do. I need a Savior. Mm -hmm. And his name is Jesus Christ. Why? Because I am a sinner. Mm -hmm. And the Savior came to save sinners. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Paul says, of which I am chief, by the way. Which is really coming to a realization of how dry our spirit is, how dry and lifeless yep. it is. Um, and, and you actually see this happening in, in this passage. I and mean, when Jesus first starts communicating with her, the responses that she has is, you know, 
Tim asking for the water, just simply things like, why are you asking me? Yep. Right? Or... Um, you don't have anything to, to draw? Do, right, you don't have anything to draw? Oh, um, do you have a well greater than Jacob's? And, and, and you kind of see just all this focus on the water, but then eventually she comes to this point in verse 15. Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw, which is two things. Number one, I don't want to have to keep coming out here to draw because yep. this is hard work. Uh, maybe it's because she has to face the ridicule of the community. Um, but the first thing she said is, give me this water so I may not thirst. It's the first time you see her identify her own issue, yep. her own dryness. And that's what God will often do is he'll, he'll orchestrate some things in our lives just to make his presence known. But eventually, you have to come to that point where you realize your dryness. Yep. And realize, in our case, know what your sin is. So you then can then cry out and say, okay, I have no way to take care of this. I don't have a way to quench this, not on an ongoing basis. I can quench it for the moment, but I, I have no way to have this living water. I, I not only have this need, I don't have it within me to do. Right. I need you to give it to me. And that's where we see her coming to. You know, and I think that's a great point that you brought out here in verse 15, where she says, Sir, give me this water. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I think she still was thinking about the tangible mm -hmm. or the material, God was now drawing her from the material now to something better. Mm -hmm. But what he had to do is now he had to point out to her, your need is greater than just walking up and down this hill. Yeah. You know, that's, that's nothing. Your need is greater than that. Mm -hmm. And let me explain to you why your need is greater than that. And that's when he asks her, go call your husband and come hither. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden, can you imagine her face when Jesus says to her, go call your husband? Mm -hmm. I can't. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and just back up, because I want us to get there, but one, one other thing that stands out in my mind is this all started with Jesus saying, give me a drink. Yep. And it culminates with her saying, no, you give me a drink. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and again, it was huge for Jesus as a Jew to ask her. But how much greater of an issue was it for a woman in that day to ask of a man, even of the same nationality, right. for a drink? You didn't do that, no less right. do it, doing it at this level. And so the fact that she had... A level of passion with her and her now that it's like I don't care what this looks like to anybody else my, I understand my need and I am willing to do what's necessary right to have that need met right so I have a need now it's not just a need of our society our culture mm -hmm. and all that. it's my personal need yeah. I think it's really neat how Jesus draws this and just simply ask her that one little question go call your husband <laughs> You know, and I'm sure she was taken back, and so she goes and answered and said, I have no husband. I mean, she could have just left it that way. I don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm a single woman, mm -hmm. all right? But Jesus didn't let her just gloss over mm -hmm. where she was at, because Jesus then goes and points out to her, no, you have well said that you have no husband, but you had five, and the one you're living with right now is not your husband. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he goes and just points out to her, yeah, this is who you are. Mm -hmm. Can you just imagine that woman? But I remember the day that I, I trusted Christ as my Savior. I was 19 years old when I did that. And, you know, I don't think I was that terrible or bad a kid. However, guess what? When I saw me for who I was, mm -hmm. and when I saw me for the need that I had, of this Savior Jesus Christ and how he revealed things in my life that, that nobody knew about, but just my heart, but my heart was just so bursting with, wow, you know, I need this Savior because he knows all about me. He knows everything about me. And I asked Christ and trusted Christ to come into my life to save me. Same experience that she had because he goes and says, okay, you, as, on, as far as you've gone, you've been honest. But you have not been totally honest, you know, and then he brings out the rest of the honesty by mm -hmm. saying, hey, I know you. Yeah. I know you in and out. I know everything about you. But then I got to love her response. 
Because it wasn't, yeah, you're right. I've done badly. Yeah. Her very next response, I can see that you're a prophet. Now, let's change the subject. Yeah. Yeah, let, really. Let, yeah. Let's now talk let's about not, yeah. this whole Jew and Samaria worshiping on the mountain thing. Right. Let, let's get the tension, because now you're hitting a little close to home. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and sometimes that thing is when, when you come and encounter with God, he has a tendency to reveal your stuff. Yeah. You know, we saw that happen with Peter in the boat. When he first realized it was Jesus in the boat, what was his response? Woe is me. Yeah. You know, um, and so, and, and Jesus, of course, ministered to him right there. But when you see your stuff, you, you have a choice to either face it or run from it. You, you can't just stay at status quo. And so you almost see her having this little wrestle at this one moment when she is immediately confronted with the fact of, ooh, he knows me. <laughs> really deeply right. and and I think she's trying to make some peace in her mind with how because I think the response is very natural we tend to get defensive when we're confronted oh, of course we do and, and we see a little bit of that here with her yeah. even you know I, I don't know and I suspect you've had the same uh, experiences that I've had there's been numbers of times through the years of my pastorate that I'd be standing at the door greeting people as they leave and I'd have someone or a number of someone's come to the door and said was I the only one in church today and I said, no, you know that we've got, you know, however many. Well, it seems like your sermon was just about me. Sorry, I yeah. didn't, you know, that, I had no idea. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> yeah, don't shoot the messenger. But the thing is, is, is the very same thing with, with what Jesus does with this woman mm -hmm. is, you know, hey, if the Holy Spirit of God is pointing to you and saying, hey, this message is for you today, heed mm -hmm. it, take care of it, deal mm -hmm. with it, you know. But I've had so many people say, Pastor, I felt like I was the only one you were talking with today because this is exactly down my alley, you know, kind of thing. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. You know, I just didn't. It wasn't like God came with a bolt of light and said, speak to so-and-so today. No, he doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd mess it up if I did. So, you know, that's what Jesus did with her. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he identified her and her need mm -hmm. and her sinfulness so that she could be honest with him. Mm -hmm. But then she had to go and take a responsibility. But before that, you know, and I know time is waning here, you know, Psalm 42, one of our favorite songs, and there's a chorus, as a deer mm. pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you or thirsts for you. And that's, that's what we need to do. We need to learn what it is to thirst after God. Mm -hmm. We need to learn what it is to thirst after godliness. Mm -hmm. And boy, is that missing in our world today. You know, anything but godliness, it seems like they're thirsting after. And, and you know, if you read or you watch different news reports and the things that they're saying, even about our Jesus at this point, you know, you know that they're doing anything but thirsting after God. Mm -hmm. But God says, I want you to thirst after me. Yeah. I want you to thirst after me. And if you thirst after me, I want you to drink from my cup. Mm -hmm. You know? Because this is what I've done for you. I, I just so love that. Psalm 63, 1. My soul thirsts for thee. What an amazing psalm. Psalm 143, 5 and 6. My soul thirsts as I'm in a thirsty land. I'm in the desert. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've had occasion in my life to be in Israel and to go into the desert there in Israel and to see, you know, and when there is a lake there, guess what? You can't drink out of it because it's the Dead Sea, you know, and it is. You go and you dive into the Dead Sea, it would flip you right over like that. Just mm. because of the intensity of the salt. Mm. That, I mean, it's just, and you can't, you just can't dive into it. It's just one of those things. So, you know, wait a minute. You thirst after it. And that's what we as Christians need to learn to do. I mm -hmm. need to learn what it is. We need to learn what it is to truly thirst after Jesus Christ, and he promised. Mm -hmm. It's not a suggestion. Right. He promised, I will quench your thirst. Mm -hmm. I will satisfy your thirst. I will satisfy your every need. Mm -hmm. And we all have a thirst. Yeah. You know, and, and we're trying to fill it one way or another. In fact, King Solomon tried to fill it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of his life, he said, Vandy, Vandy, all is Vandy. It's all a chasing after the wind. What was he basically saying? He's like, all the things that I thirsted for, all the things that I thought would bring satisfaction, I went after them all. He was the richest man ever known to ever walk the face of this planet. Yep. 
But yet at the end of it all, even though financially, socioeconomically, positionally, on every level, he had everything there was to be had. And at the end, he basically said, I still thirst. Yep. I'm still empty. And, and so it's understand the world's never, ever going to fill it. Right. I don't care if it's money, sex, drugs, anything whatsoever. Um, it's not going to satisfy. The only thing that's going to satisfy is Jesus himself. You know, I love, I love what, where it says uh, in John 14, verse 27, my joy I give to you, or my peace I give unto mm -hmm. you. Not the peace that the world gives do I give unto you. Why? Because the world can't give us any peace. Right. It has no peace. It knows no peace. Mm -hmm. But my peace I give unto you. And that's what it is to drink of him. Yep. That's what it is to drink of him. You know, and, and to, to, to complete this account, because Colin just gave us the high sign, to complete this account, what does she do? After Jesus talked with her, she went up, she, she ran up into the hill, and she told the people, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Mm -hmm. What did she see? She saw him as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. She saw him as God. Yep. All right? She didn't say, this is the Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's his earthly name. No, this is the Christ. Verse 49. Then they went out of the city and came to him. And in the meantime, you know, some, some were saved through her testimony, but most of them were saved because they said, oh, we heard and we saw for ourselves. Yeah. And we know that Jesus stayed there for a while just yeah, to minister to them two as days. people. But what I really, the other thing that I really love is understand, and yes, God cares about our own personal thirst. But in as much as this was about the Samaritan woman, it wasn't just about her. Because you see when the disciples came back, as it tells us later, and he, he goes to that whole thing about, you know, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. But then he goes immediately and he changes the tune. And I can't help but catch a visual of what was happening because we see by reading all the accounts that she went and, and she had gone and she had talked to the other women. And they came out. And I can't help but wonder if this section that we see 34 through 38 took place during the time as she is saying to the other people, you've got to come and see him. Because what does Jesus say? He then goes on saying, you know what? Because again, he knows their heart. He knows their question. Why are we even here? Mm -hmm. Why were you talking to her? And then Jesus turns and says, look, he says, behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look to the fields, for they're already white for harvest. I can't help but think that that moment when he said, look up to the fields, he's saying, look down the road. Yep. Do you see all those Samaritans coming down here? She just went and shared who I am with them. Yep. And now they are coming forth to seek. You know, and, and I can't, it, it just so overwhelms me to stop and think about what kind of joy must have overtaken Jesus' heart mm -hmm. at that moment when not only she, but she was willing to go and bring all those that she knew yep. to him. Yep. It, it's, it's a fascinating account. I don't call it a story because mm -hmm. a story can be something made up. Yep. This is not made up. This is an actual account that happened. Mm -hmm. And if it happened then, it can happen today. That's right. You know, and one last verse, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? For they shall be filled or satisfied. Yeah. And we know that to be true. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, be honest with him. And simply be honest with him saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need you to come into my life. I invite you today to come into my life. Take over my life. I want to drink of this water that you give. And this water that not only quenches my thirst here on earth, but one day it will quench because I have eternal life with you. Trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I'm Pastor Harold Noyes, pastor of the Community Christian Church. We um, have morning worship at 9.30 every Sunday morning on the Lower Road in Athens, Vermont. We also have an evening service at 6 o'clock. We're going through the book of 1 Timothy. And then we have Bible studies all during the week. And if you get into the web webpage of Community Christian Church, you will find what those are, or you can find our office number and you can call it, and you've got it right there on the screen. Tim? And if you're in the Charlestown area, Life on Main meets at the old St. Luke's Episcopal Building and uh, at 188 Main Street, and so we invite you to come on down and join us for a great time of worship and fellowship and teaching of the Word, again, 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. We do thank you also for just for tuning into this broadcast. Um, let people know if you're in 
the Vermont um, Connecticut River Valley area. We're on all the stations from Brattleboro up to Springfield and up in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, let people know about it. Go to our Facebook page if you're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Heartline Ministries. Share the videos or whether you're sharing it from the fact number 8.com website, which is Falls Area Community Television. Uh, share those videos. Let's get the word out there. Let's, if you're getting benefit from these episodes, share it with those that you know. And, uh, and if you're tuning in from anywhere outside our normal viewing area, just drop us a note on Facebook. Let us know where you're tuning in from because we do like to pray for those. We are so thankful that God has expanded this ministry now uh, to where we're in 35 of 50 different states. We have people watching us that we know of, yep. as well as 22 different countries going all the way from United States all the way over even into the Middle East and into the Far East, all the way down into New Zealand now. Yep. And uh, so we're just amazed at what God's doing. But we want to see every country. We want we want to be in every country, not right. for our sake, but just to know we are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Right. So, right. so thank you so much for watching Hotline Ministry. I'm Pastor Harold. For Pastor Tim, may God bless your day.